So chapter two, uh, you know, that's how I start off way at the beginning talking about this whole toys plus rules thing. So chapter one, what were the toys? What did we, what did we just learn? What were the toys? Propositions. You know, these declarative sentences that are true or false, but not both. And if I would write something like P denotes, that's still a, a propositional sentence. That's a declarative sentence that's either true or false, but not both. I'm just not going to tell you what it is. That's the whole idea of a variable, right? College algebra, x. What is that? It's a number. What number is it? Why do I have to tell you? Maybe that's my question, right? You treat it as if it is a number, and you go on with all of your work. And so we have all the ideas of propositions. And then give me, like, what are some of the things that came out in the structure of this? What are some of the stuff that you did with propositions? We did what? We did and, or, we did exclusive or, we did logical equivalencies, we did rules of inference, et cetera, right? We had all these applications, right? You know, we did applications on all this. So when are things, if we would go back, this was a question of what? That was a question of sameness. When are things the same? We had things that are important. The whole purpose of building up knowledge was to build up things that are tautologies. We want to just deal with truths and see what we get out of it. In the end, it was playing with our toys, things that we declare, right, that are either true or false, but not both. And at the very bottom, we had things that are true. We just accept it. We have terms of things that are. We just accept them. But then we start building using this stuff, all right? Now that we have this skill, we're going to start to go to a new branch and say, hey, look, I have this ability to make new stuff, but I'm going to go and make new toys, new rules, but you this, use the same skill set like we have here to play with our new objects and then work it out. And this will happen a lot in this class. So chapter two starts all over, and we'll have our toys. And what are the toys going to be? They're going to be sets. And then we're going to have rules. And, well, we're going to have to kind of work out. Now, if we look at the rules that we did before, we had ways to manipulate several into one, right? That's compound propositions. Here's two. But if I say my name is Mark and the sky is blue, that's actually one object that was made out of two using the word and, right? It's a way of assembling them. We'll do the same thing. We're going to have to define what are we talking about sets. This is, in particular, this is called naive set theory because we're talking about naive sets. And then the rules are how do we put them together? We're going to ask questions of what does it mean to be the same? A same is really, in a way, it's a comparison. And for sets, there'll be many comparators. We'll talk about equality. We'll talk about subset. We'll talk about proper subset. We'll talk about equivalent. All these different ways of comparing these things under this idea of sameness. And are they the same? Are they quite the same? Do they have the same stuff? Right? We'll have that word same is all going to have all these different things. We'll talk about putting them together. Union, intersection. Right? We'll go through these different representations. So really what we do is we just simply reboot new toys, new rules. Let's see what we can do with it. And is it interesting at all? Math itself has a reason right, for being. We model things that are. So a set. If I'm going to model stuff that is. How would you explain what is a set? Give me an example of a set in your head. This is a set, and I, it's a set of what? Cards. cards or cards. Did you say card or cars? Cards. Cards with a D? Yeah. OK. Cards. So what would that be? Collection. So we have a collection, right? And so you could say a person has it. Like, here, here's my set of cards. And you might go through it. OK, here's a George Brett as a uh, rookie year. Here's another George Brett of a year, rookie year, but it's in better condition. Right? And they would just simply go through these cards. Oh, this is an ace of spades. <coughs> well, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> you have the middle of that. And it, you would look at this, and you, another person says, well, I have a set of cars. Without the D. It's like you have somebody who's like, what do you have? Oh, I got a DeLorean, I got a Porsche, right? It's Jay Leno. 
I have a steam-powered car, which he does, and he drives it in. I saw pictures of that. He's like driving it down normal streets. Kind of interesting. So what would be the same of both of those if they're, the, they're a set? We both said the word set. One's in cars, one's in cards. Somebody has sets of math books. Somebody has sets of computers. What seems to be universal about them? Well, we had one word here. They seem to be a collection. The collection itself just te tended to be scattered, right? They could go through and say in order of cost or just because they're there or they threw it up in the air and it fell on the ground. So it's not only just a collection, it seems to be a unordered. of cars, cards, numbers, books, just kind of stuff, right? But stuff doesn't seem like a very good mathematical name because it could really be anything. And the stuff that's in it, this is really anything at all, chairs, students, ideas, whatever you want. So normally we would get this and say that's kind of a bad name. We would call this elements or maybe members, if we want to have a better, sounds better than stuff, but stuff is a better concept behind it because it's just an unordered collection of stuff. <coughs> we'll get why when we have representations on, of this on why this is called naive set theory. This is a good definition for sets. It's a naive definition for sets, and for a particular reason, when we try to like, represent them, and we'll start to see why this might be naive. Some notation. Typically, use uppercase as a set variable. In other words, for example, s is a set. Um, typically, use lowercase as an element. Example, say A is in set S. Uh, notation for that element of notation. If I say A is in set S, would look like this A is an element of S. Kind of looks like an E. I suppose that's a better, there's element of. On the other hand, this would be A is not an element of S. Which would be, if we'd want to write it that way, we could say that it is not the case that A is an element of S is normally written as A is not an element of S. That's normally how we use our notation. It's not true that A is in S. Okay, that A is not in S. So those are some symbols that we could talk about, things being in a set or not. Uh, how do I represent sets and elements? The first one I'll talk about is a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram has three parts. The 
box is necessary, labeled U. The box itself is our universe of discourse for all possible elements. So it's like, what elements are you talking about? Right? So if, if we want to talk about sets of cards, my universe would be every possible card that would ever exist. And so that's what the box entitles. If somebody's talking about books, then it would be books and not cards. But on the other hand, if you, you could actually have a U and say the universe of discourse is every possible thing that would ever possibly be. Ideas, numbers, whatever. That could be your big U. So the big U is always here. We, we must have the big bracket. If you don't have the big bracket, Venn diagram isn't a Venn diagram. So students a lot of times start drawing without the big rectangle. If we don't have the big rectangle, it's not a Venn diagram. Right? And you have to have U telling me what, what are you talking about. Now inside of this, if I would have a set, S is normally represented by a circle. So sets are normally represented by circles. And then elements are normally written as dots. So if I would look at this particular thing, I could notice that, OK, A is an element of S, but B is not an element of S. And S is a set. If you don't know what elements are in there, you don't necessarily have to draw the dots. You would just draw the circle. I have a set. What's nice about Venn diagrams, it's a nice visual way of your collection. Right? You could sit there and write down every possible card, and then you draw a circle around, these are the ones I've got, and these are the ones you've got. So it's a nice visual representation of sets. Just simply collect them in, inside of nice little circles. We have inside and outside. Makes it really interesting when your universe of discourse isn't necessarily a rectangle, like it's, say, a, a ball. And then you could do things like, you know, how could you make the smallest possible fence to, in, to contain every animal on the face of the planet but you. You're going to collect everything, and you want to make the fence as small as possible. Well, since it's a ball, you could just do this. Put a fence around yourself and say, I'm on the outside. And then that's the inside. Small fence contains everything. You know, you can get away with things like that, right? It's just simply a boundary, however you want to play around with your boundary. So that's a Venn diagram. Another way of doing uh, representing a set is a roster or a list. A roster or a list is just simply this. My set A is made up of uh, A1, the number 1, a square, a happy face, and an astonished person. How do you make a list? You just make a curly bracket and then separate things by commas. This gets really interesting if your thing in it has commas. Like maybe I could even do this. Uh, how about B? What's B made up? It's made up of the, the letter A, the set with 1, 2, and 3 in it, and then a square. Notice how this guy here has 1, 2, 3 things. All right, this comma, these commas separate the elements, and then I have another, well, that, that means I have a new object, and my new object happens to be a set. What can I put into sets? Anything. It's a collection of stuff. Does order matter? No. Could I have many copies some, of something? Sure. I could sit there and say C is made up of A, 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 and Z. Just a collection of stuff. What stuff do you put in it? I do not care. What can you put in it? Anything you want. You can have sets of sets. You can have sets of sets, and the set that's inside the set is a set of sets. Put in what anything, anything at all. Don't care. So that's one way to handle it. When we do lists, one of the things we can get away with is to use the ellipsis. 
Say one, two, three. What if I wanted to go to 100? And I don't want to write all 100. Dot, dot, dot is an ellipsis in 100. Now, please do not, I've had students do this to me before. This has five elements. One, two, three, the dot, dot, dot thing, and then 100. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not what I mean by dot, dot, dot. What, the dot, dot, dot ellipsis is continue the pattern until you show up on the other side. I just, I'm lazy. I don't want to write four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, up to, up to, right? I just even said the word, up to 100. I don't want to keep talking. Even though I'm a teacher, all teachers love to keep talking. But what if you had a set of characters? That then, that's, that's actually an important thing. What if I had a set of strings? Is that a string object? The dot, dot, dot is actually a particular single character. Right? Think about like Unicode. I mean, it's, you know, every one of these, and this actually is interesting in like human language, right? It's the set of stuff. What is, what is Unicode, right? It's just simply a lookup table. It says the first thing is this, the second thing is this. What are characters? The character could be interpreted as a command, but it's still a character. You say carriage return. Carriage return is actually a character. If you choose to do something about it, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. It's actually something. So. That's just collections of stuff. We have to sometimes think really hard, and the book does that to you. It has all these like stuff and kind of plays around. Is it is, for example, is the number three one of the elements of E? Is the number one an element of E? Yes. One is indeed the element of E because it's one of the elements. Is two an element of E? Yes. Is three an element of E? No. What's the third? What is the third object? It's a set that happens to contain three. So three's not in it. The third thing happens to be a stuff, right? It's one of the reasons why I like the word stuff. You have to be careful. You would say, all right, this this and this, it, if you didn't interpret it, right? this would be actually rather easy if you didn't try to intellectually interpret it and you didn't know what the symbols actually represented. right? I could do things like, this would be easier if I would have done made E something like this. Uh, happy face and then that and farlyishness. And we look at that. And you sit there and say, like, don't interpret it. What, how many objects do you see? I see three. Some use symbols. I don't know what the symbols interpret, but they're just three symbols. How would I know what's in it? It needs to look exactly like that. What would happen if I would leave off, like, for farlyishness? I left off the SS and I said, well, was that in it? And it's like, no, 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 it needs, it needs to look exactly like that. The stuff needs to look exactly like the stuff. So be careful about trying to over-interpret the problem, right? Over-interpreting over the problem would be, look, just three things. What's the three things? The next representation of this set builder notation This basically uses logic to build the set. And so this looks like this. The set S is made up of, all right, now there are going to be two parts within my set separated by a bar. And the first thing that happens here is a basic element type. Then I have a bar, which this particular bar is the word such that. And then over here, I have a propositional function. Seems awkward, but let's have an example. S is made up of all E such that 
E is a integer and E is greater than or equal to 1 yet less than 6. So what is it? It's E. Well, what's E? It's an integer. Okay, integers are you know, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, going off to the infinities. Negative infinity, positive infinity. And, on the other hand, E needs to be bigger than or equal to 1, yet less than 6. Could I have taken this particular thing and rather put it in roster form? What would this look like as a roster? Four, five. Oh, no, it does not include six. Does not include six. Very good. So, can you see how logic can help us a little bit to get rid of an issue with something that has a lot of stuff? We can just use set builder notation. Right? Set builder notation allows me to build some complicated things. It's an element. Well, what type of an element? An element that meets these things. And then if it meets it, it's in it. If it doesn't meet it, it's not. That's why it's a propositional function. What happened? If I plug 1 into this propositional function, 1 is an integer. 1 is less than or equal to 1, which is less than 6. Both of those are what? True. So it's true. So it's in it. What happens if I plug in pi? Is pi greater than or equal to 1, yet less than 6? Yes, but is pi an integer? No. So it's false and true, which is false. So pi is not in my set. Because I can't write three. Okay. I think didn't I even say three? I might not even said three. And it was one, two, three, four, five. But I don't. It's, I probably could put and not three. <laughs> but see how you can get complicated on this. And one of the things that can happen is, is if you look at sets, one of the questions that we'll need to do at times is, if I gave you a list, could you give me a propositional function that generated the list? Or if I gave you a propositional function, could you generate the list? Can we go back and forth? Here's the list. Give me the function. Here's the function. Give me the list. You should be able to interpret those particular things. Now, this seems a very natural way of talking about sets. This automatically gets us into the issue of naive set theory. Here's my example. I'm going to take all men and I'm going to split them into two groups. We've already talked about this before. Here's my two groups. The guys go into group A if they meet the special barber. Who's the special barber? The special barber is the guy who says, I'll give you a shave if you've never shaved yourself, and so then I'm going to go ahead and allow you to come to my barber shop. So those are the people allowed to come to his barber shop. Did you ever give yourself a shave? Yes, I gave myself a shave. You're not allowed to come to my barber shop, so you go into group two. So we line up every man on the face of the planet, and we say, OK, which group are you in? You go into set allowed in, set not allowed in. Then all of a sudden, he turns around and looks in the mirror. Which set is he in? Can he go into his own barber shop? Well, if he's in set A, that would mean that he's never shaved himself, which means he's supposed to shave himself. But if he's, supposed to, but if he's shaved himself, he's not allowed in A. He's supposed to go to B. But so he's a guy that would exist in what? Both at the same. If he's in A, he must be in B. But if he's in B, he's rather supposed to have been A and not in B. So which one does he go to? And the answer is, well, he kind of sort of exists in both, right? That's, it causes a problem with, essentially, that whole, it needs to be true or false, but not both. So naive set theory, a collection of stuff, automatically leads to these paradoxes. And so normally what we have to do is form what's called axiomatic set theory. And axiomatic set theory is to go down to at the bottom and say, all right, fine. No, it's, it's collections, but we have these postulates. But that's way more complicated than what we really want to do, because naive set theory is pretty much good enough when we want to model things in the real world. You actually model splitting guys up according to shaving issues, and the answer is no. If you hit a paradox on your definition of a set, then you picked a bad definition of a set and skip it. That's just a bad thing that you're talking about. Handle it as you do the set. You know, use a little bit of common sense as we go through it. So, 
That's why it's called naive set theory. Yeah, there could be a paradox. Who cares? If there is an issue, we'll skip it. I'll just say that I didn't think hard enough on that particular problem. All right. So that's how we can represent sets. We can list them. We can use set, no we can use set builder notation. We can write Venn diagrams. What are some sets that everybody should know? 